We're in week seven, the final week of our Why Jesus. This Give Peace a Chance kicks off next week. You guys aren't going to want to miss that. You're going to want to make sure you're here. If you're not here, you're going to want to make sure that you catch the video uh, or you can catch the uh, on iTunes. We're listed on iTunes, so you can catch the podcast there. But you're definitely going to want to catch that series. It's going to impact you. Um, we're going to talk about passion. And if, so you, if you're here the whole time, you'll be able to catch what we do as we run a whole circle around passion. But you're going to want to make sure you're here. But now we're going to go to Why Jesus. Because why Jesus? We, we've talked about why Jesus lots. Six weeks, actually. This is number seven. But today, I think, is kind of our, our defining moment. Why Jesus? Why do we live a life for Jesus? Because here's the truth, I think, for every one of us. We want to make a difference. Right? You don't wake up in the morning in your life and say, I just want to be nothing. You want to make a difference, whether it's with your children, whether it's with your parents, your family, your coworkers, your friends, people you meet at the gas station. You want to make a difference somehow. And so Jesus teaches us that he made a difference, right? Without Jesus, we wouldn't be here right now, right? There's lots of people going through life without Jesus, and they're not sure why they're going through it. But the fact is, with Jesus, we have an opportunity to make a difference, so that, that's what I want to talk to you about today. I want to talk to you about a guy who made a difference in life, although initially he didn't think he was going to. Initially, he was just a fisherman, right? He was doing the family business. He's doing what he was supposed to do. Anyone ever do that? You just do what you're supposed to do. Anybody? A couple of you, three, four of you. Now, listen, some of you that raise your hands, I know you. So let's, let's get real. Um, but... We just do what we, we, we all really want to make a difference. We want to impact the world. We want to leave a legacy behind us. Because the only legacy that you ever leave is how you impact people. You could build the biggest buildings. You could have the most money. And you know what? When you're dead and gone, none of that matters. We don't talk about what George Washington built. We talk about George Washington as the president. We talk about what he did as an individual. We don't talk about what people build necessarily. It's always about what they did. How did they impact people? So Peter impacted people, right? Good and bad. In his ministry, as he began, and I, I like to say, still on training wheels, Peter impacted a little bitty girl, right? As she said, aren't you the one that was with Jesus? And Peter said, nope, not me. Liar, liar, pants on fire. She, no, no, I know that you're with him. I've seen you. No, it's not me. That impacted the little girl, didn't it? And then finally, he decided he'd cuss at her just to make sure. See, we impact people every day, whether it's negatively or positively. You're either going to push people closer to Jesus Christ or you're going to help them go further away. The choice is ultimately yours. Now, how many of you, if I could tell you four things that could help you prevent, now, you're never going to completely remove it, but help you prevent it the best you can, how many would want to know that? To prevent people from going to hell, right? It, it is their choice, but you can do the best that you can do, right, to live at peace with people. You can do the best that you can do to live a life that glorifies Jesus. You can do the best that you can do to be the living Bible that people read. Peter gives us four things. I'm glad that you agreed that you want to know. Honestly, I was going to tell you anyways. Open your Bible, 1 Peter, if you've got a Bible. If you don't have a Bible, let me say this. We always put it on the screen. I always put it on your notes. You, if you've got a phone, it's on your phone. But there ain't nothing like a paper Bible. I mean, there just ain't nothing like I got lots of them. I got problem, Right? I switched from one addiction to the next, but I think Bibles are better than, al better than alcohol. So uh, if you don't have a Bible, let me just, I'll go out on a limb right now to say that if you don't have a Bible, you come and see me and I will make sure that you get a Bible. Okay. I'll make sure that you get a Bible that you can understand, that you can read. And if you can't read, Garth will teach you. So if you don't come see me after service, I understand why. Okay. <laughs> 
But you need a Bible. Even though we put it there and everything else, you need a Bible. And, you know, it's okay to mark in your Bible. It's okay. It's okay to mark some notes. You say, well, preacher, it don't look like you mark in your Bible very much. I have lots of Bibles. <laughs> this is my newest Bible. You can't have this Bible, but we'll get you a Bible. First Peter chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. The Bible says, dear friends, I urge you as strangers and exiles. You ever felt strange in your own country? I mean, you ever walked into anywhere and like everyone's talking and you don't understand a single thing they're saying. Now listen, listen, I'm not saying that, I, I'm not on this to jump one way or the other. I'm just saying I can walk in somewhere and hear people speaking English and still not understand a single thing coming out of their mouth. Right? Some people are stuck on stupid and you can't do anything to fix it. Okay? And they begin to talk and you understand it. Because it's just what it is. But the Bible says, hey, I urge you as strangers and exiles in this land to abstain from sinful desires and wage war against the soul. Conduct yourselves honorably among the Gentiles. Conduct yourself honorably among the Gentiles. Conduct yourselves honorably among the lost people. Conduct yourselves honorably among the drug addicts, the alcoholics, the people who aren't following Jesus Christ. There's a reason for that. Hang on. So that when they slander you as evildoers, they will observe your good works and will glorify God on the day he visits. I, I just real quick, well, I'm not going to say real quick. It's out early last week. You may not get early today, but I, I want to give you four big things, and then there's five and seven little things under those four big things that I think will help you if you'll do them. Okay, it's kind of like a parent. Whenever your, your parents, my parents used to tell me all the time, son, if you will do this, it will help you. I didn't do it. I'd get hurt or something would happen. Down the road, I'd go back to them. I'd say, well, why didn't you tell? And they said, I told you if you do this, it would help you. And eventually I did it, and it did help. So I, I want to help you on the front end and say, if you'll do these four things, it will help you. Peter was moved by God, inspired by the Holy Spirit, the Bible says, to pen these words. So if we will do what God has instructed us to do, it'll help us. They're real complicated, so get ready. That, they actually come right out of the verses. So, number one in your notes, abstain from sinful desires. Now, I could have just said abstain from sin. That would have been good. Peter could have said abstain from sin. That would have been great. But he didn't say that. He said abstain from sinful desires. Because sin begins where? In your heart. See, it's a desire that begins, and then it grows into an action. That's why Jesus speaking said, hey, if you lust after a woman, he's talking to guys, but now we can talk to guys or gals. If you lust after a woman in your heart, you've already committed adultery. See, Peter says, hey, abstain from sinful desires because the war that you're fighting isn't necessarily a physical war. But it's one that starts inside of you. Paul tells us in Romans 7, right? That there are things that I don't want to do that I do and the things that I don't do, I want to do, right? There are things inside of us, guys, that when we dwell on them too long, you get tripped up. You get caught up. It's like in Iraq when they were over there and the war was first beginning. People had to walk around in their bulletproof vests and their helmets all the time. I mean, that's what they did. And the rules of engagement at that point were you don't shoot at anybody unless they shoot first. Sounds fair, right? So there were people that would come up to the fences. There were people breaking into their camps, but they weren't firing a bullet, so they weren't able to shoot at them. 
let's just say we lost a lot of lives. Because if you wait for me to shoot you first before you can do anything, bad things tend to happen. They changed the rules of engagement. Now it was if someone looked at you and they were coming towards the fence, if, they, if you thought there was bodily harm that could happen, you shot them. You know what happened? The insurgents quit coming so close to the fence. Do you know what would happen in your own life if as desires began to swell up in your heart, as you began to think on things too long, you began to recite, recite the Bible, you began to go to Jesus and ask him to get that stuff out? Do you realize that you wouldn't have to go so often to say, God, forgive me for doing this because you would have stopped it at the very center? See, Peter says, abstain from sinful desires because he knows where it all begins. The Bible says the heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? It's, it's so funny to me to hear people say, well, I know my own heart. You don't know nothing. Your heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? If you're counting on your heart to lead you places, hey, you're in a problem. And you know what? You're going to be at war your entire life. It's just what it is. It's kind of like, Norm, you remember when computers first came out? I had to go to Norm because I wasn't sure anyone else was old enough. Uh, when computers first came out, I remember I was in high school. And they, they were out before, but, you know, the first computer would fill this entire room just to add 2 plus 2. Okay? Now I got a watch that will do more than most people's computers. But when they first came out, I was learning to program computers. And so we were writing programs, and they, ha they had this saying, garbage in, garbage out, right? You put garbage into the computer in your program, and automatically it spits out garbage because it's just doing what you told it to do. What if Christians applied that to their life? See, when you put garbage in your life, do you know what ultimately comes out? Garbage. Your sinful desires... Garbage, right? And when we feed those desires, what comes out? Sin. Garbage. People don't understand. It's like, pastor, my life is so bad and all this is happening. What do I do? Well, what are you doing? Well, I do this and this and this. Well, stop doing that. But th that's not the problem. It's this. No, that's the problem. See, it's the very first thing. It usually starts the problem abstain from sinful desires and you can make a difference in people's lives. Why? Because people are watching you. You know, as Peter wrote this, Peter understood that people were watching him, right? He just had an encounter. He knew people were watching him. But back then, people were watching Christians. They, they have a, back then, their lifestyles were a little bit different than ours. So, where now, if someone is looking in our window, we call them a peeping Tom and we have them arrested. Right? Fair enough. Right? Some of you awake? Okay. Then, listen, then it was different. Number one, they didn't have windows to shut. Okay? But it was not uncommon for people to stand at a window and look in to see what you were doing in your house. It gets worse, Ben. It was not uncommon... For them just to come on in your house, sit down and make themselves at home and watch what you were doing. It was, it was a common practice. They, that's just how it was. So they knew people were watching them. Today, we don't think anyone watched us, right? We go into our office, we close our office door and ain't no one in here. You get on the computer and do your stuff, ain't no one seeing it. Let me tell you, anytime time you strike a key on a computer, it's there forever. Anytime you think, oh, well, that person's not here, they're never going to know. Be sure your sins will find you out. That's just as true today as what it was when they penned it in the Old Testament. Why? Because Hebrew says that Jesus is the same today, yesterday, and forever. See, it's going to happen. You're going to have to deal with it at one point or another. Isn't it better just not to have to worry about it? I mean... I talk to people sometimes and they, they give me so many stories. And then I talk to them a couple days later and they can't remember the stories they gave me. 
And it's like, well, I, no, you said that. No, I didn't. Well, hang on. This is what I do now. I text them. Or I email them all in the same feed. So then I can just say, go up five conversations and it's right there. See, your sinful desires are the same thing. If you're not willing to battle those desires, let me ask you a couple questions. Do you ever feel like hating someone just because of their skin color? Now, don't answer the questions. But hang on. We, if this is your first time here, you're like, man, what is wrong with this guy? There's a list. Okay? Just wait. You'll find out. But we're just real. Okay? We're just going to be true and transparent here. So that's a question that regardless of who you are, and maybe some of it comes to do with the way you were raised, that's a question that is a real question for people. Do you ever feel like hating someone because of their skin color? Do you ever think about having an affair? Husbands, let me just say, don't shake your head yes. I don't have time for marriage counseling today. Are you ever tempted to cheat at work? Do you resent those who get ahead by cutting corners? Go ahead. You can all do this because it's all true. I know some of you are holier than holy, but it's all true. Okay? You'd be like bobbleheads right now. It's okay. Do you hold grudges against those who mistreat you? Do you spend your time dreaming or thinking about things that you shouldn't be dreaming or thinking about? That's the PG version of it because I got three boys in here, four boys in here. And I, I love to think that my boys used to think that shut up was just a cuss word and that was as bad as it got. So it's PG. Do you ever get caught doing that? Do you ever think... I wish I weren't a Christian just for a few minutes so I could do whatever I wanted to. You know, some of you laugh about that, but hey, that's real. I mean, it's 100% real. Those are things that people think about sometimes. Well, if I wasn't a Christian, I could do this. You know, I hear people say, well, I don't want to become a Christian because once I become a Christian, it is no fun. Right? I mean, if I become a Christian, man, I soak up, suck up, and look like a prune. It is no fun anymore. There is no fun being a Christian. I just don't want to do it. I'm going to live like hell until the very last moment. Then I'm going to get saved and go to heaven. Right? Listen, I said it. I've said that very statement. Man, it got so quiet in here, you could hear the mouse pee on cotton. Listen, it's true. We have these desires inside of us. The reason it's got some of you so quiet is because some of you guys got those desires. Right? And it's a whole different world if we just talk about sin, but we don't name them. It's like that sign out front. I met with three different people this week who told me that sign resonated to them. Alcoholic, drug addict, street walker, rich, we all resonate with poor, right? Uh, single, married, divorced, shacked up, jacked up, broken up. See, it resonates with all of us. Some people have a problem with it. Why? Because we put it in their face what they are. We put it in our face what we are, and then we have to answer to it. We have to acknowledge it. It's the same thing with this. Abstain from sinful desires. See, if it's in your head and it's something that shouldn't be there, it's a sinful desire and we need to abstain. We need to back off from it because sinful desires, your behavior will always dictate, be dictated by your belief, right? Beliefs are something inside your head. Your behavior feeds off of that. And if we don't abstain from sinful desires in our life, we're going to get caught doing things that we shouldn't be doing. It's going to happen. Let me give you some practical suggestions of how to abstain from those desires. I was like looking at that. And I'm like, how in the world are you guys going to see that? But it's a little bigger there. Uh, be honest about your struggles. 
Be honest about your struggles. You know what? Everybody in here struggles. Everybody struggles. It's whether or not you're going to be honest about it or not. Right? You can say, oh, I never struggle, and you can be a hypocrite. But everybody struggles. Just be honest about it. I'm not saying you got to come up here and get the mic and say, hi, my name is Tony, and I'm... You don't have to do that. But there should be relationships that you have with people in this building, right, that you can be honest about your struggles with. Some of you guys are really honest to me. Too honest sometimes. But you need to find people that you can be honest about your struggles. B, cry out to God for his mercy. Because there's only one person that can fix it. His name's not Tony. Okay? I, I know you're right in there. I, I want to help you, but crying out to God for his mercy is the best thing you can do. C, ask a friend. Does everybody have a friend? If you don't have a friend, raise your hand. Jefferson, Ben will be your friend. You have a friend, Garth? Man, you're scraping the bottom, son. Ask a friend to hold you accountable. And after you ask them to hold you accountable, accept, I didn't put this, but accept what they have to say. Because it's one thing to hold somebody accountable and try to do it, but then you're afraid to do it because they're going to be mad at you if you say something. Right? Right? Like Brad at work, he's got a guy that holds him accountable. His name's Jim. Jim just stands around. He doesn't do anything, but he holds Brad accountable. See, we have to be willing. We have to be willing to accept the accountability after we ask somebody. I got a friend back in Madison County. His name's Jackie. He's a pastor. And Jackie and I can remember when I very first got there, we went for a walk. It turned into a run. And I'm thinking, man, you're trying to kill me. But we, on that run, walk, we decided that we would hold each other accountable to make sure that we were loving our wives the way that we need to love our wives, to make sure that we were loving our children the way that we need to love our children. So Jackie will call me or I'll call him about every week just to say, hey, how are you doing this? Hey, how is your relationship with your wife? Now, I know Jackie's going to call. So whenever Joy and I are in uh, like a tussle, and it happens, and I'm not loving her the way I should love her, I ignore Jackie's phone call. And Jackie will text me after that, and he said, so it's bad today, huh? See, but Jackie has permission to hold me accountable. And he says things sometimes that I don't want to hear. You know what? I've said things sometimes that he doesn't want to hear, but you know what? That's part of the accountability that you need in your life. D, don't give up because you struggle. Don't give up. Listen, some of you guys need that one. Don't give up just because you struggle. It's not about the getting knocked down part. It's not necessarily about how you get back up. It's all about how many times you get back up. See, sometimes struggles happen. You'll face struggles in life. Some struggles will be there forever. Paul said he went to Jesus three times and he said, hey, can you remove this thorn in my flesh? There's different people that say it was different things. Some say it was his eyesight. Some say that there was some guy traveling around him that was heckling him. I don't know what it was, but Paul went three different times and said, please remove this. We're not talking about, you know, Bob that went. We're talking about the apostle Paul. And Jesus said, hey, you're good. My grace is sufficient. You know what? You're going to struggle, but I'm with you. Don't give up. Keep pushing. Paul even likens our walk to a, to a race, right? But not a sprint. It's a marathon. It's a long thing, Right? I got three boys. I got five, but I got three that love, or they used to. I don't know if they love it anymore, but they used to love to run 5Ks. Now, I'm just telling you, they get that from their mama's side because there ain't no reason I'm running anywhere. 
okay? But they loved it. So they, the very first race I took them to, it was called the Dolphin Dash, I think, out on the island. Isn't that what? And so they went out. And listen, I'm a little bit overprotective if you know me at all. And so they took off, and I'm like trying to figure out where they're at. And one of the guys said, well, you can go out there with them. I said, no, I'm good. I'll wait right here. So about 40 minutes later, it's only 3.2 miles, right, only. About 40 minutes later, here come Rawson. <sighs> but he came, right? And here come Cannon. <laughs> I said, you want to do it again? Oh, I don't know, Daddy, maybe. About an hour and 15 minutes later, here come Rylan. He come, he good. So the next year, or no, the next race was downtown. And oh, downtown's that way, not that way. Downtown. And so they had to run across the green bridge. It's not really green anymore. Okay, but it's the bridge they call the green bridge. So they had to run across the green bridge. They started down by the yacht club, had to run this way and go up and over the hill, the green bridge, down and go down over there somewhere and turn around and come back. So they finished in about the same order, right? Rawson finished at about 45 minutes. Cannon finished at about 52 minutes. And I am like worried sick at an hour and 15 minutes because I don't see Rylan. Like he is nowhere. Like kids are coming in and they're like, yeah, there's no one else. I'm like, well, what happened to him? I mean, where is he at? Did he fall off the bridge? I mean, what's going on? All of a sudden, I see this group of girls, high school girls. They turn the corner, and they're all giggling, and you know how the girls are. But I'm like, well, they're the girls. Where's my boy? And then they parted like the Red Sea. And there's Rylan right in the middle of them. Now you say, What's, what does this have to do with struggling? Hang on, I'm not done. Next year, we'll fast past all the theatrics and the next year they run the same race down at the green bridge rylan who had finished last in every race they had run rylan finished the race in 32 minutes why because he was unwilling to give up just because he was struggling he just kept trying and kept running and kept going and he finished it see guys in life, it's about getting up and finishing the race as a Christian. Not sitting down and just giving up. God doesn't want to look at, you and look at you and see that you've been sucking on a PVC pipe full of pickle juice. That's not his desire. He wants to see you running the race. Not giving up. E, look for small victories in each day. Small ones. They don't have to be big victories. I get small ones every day. There was a guy that came by yesterday. And I didn't even, I, when he came and he said, you helped me a couple months. I did not, I looked at him. I said, I don't even remember who you are. It wasn't being rude. I just didn't remember who he was. And he said, hey, you helped me. And it's because of what you did that has me trusting Jesus. I've got my life squared away. And you know what? He's here this morning. And I look at that and I say, I, I'm not good at praises for me because I don't ever want to get in the way of Jesus. But here's, here's what Jesus does for me. There's a small victory for the day. On a day that I needed a victory, Jesus says, here's a little bitty one. Here's a, now, people's lives matter, right? But I didn't do anything. Jesus did it all. So if we'll abstain from sinful desires because people are watching us, then number two, we can live an excellent life. I didn't say a perfect life. I said an excellent life. The Bible says, and I read it like 20 times just to make sure you knew. The Bible says in verse 12, conduct yourselves honorably among the Gentiles. Live an excellent life amongst the people who are watching you. Well, why are they watching me? Because you're different. You don't even have to walk around and tell them that you're different. They're just watching you, and they know that you're different. You, 
it should never be this way. It should never be, and I've heard it said, it should never be that people don't want to do business with a Christian. They should want to. It breaks my heart when I hear people say, well, I don't want to do business with them. They're a Christian. Sundays, what Sunday? I've said it a million times. It's the worst day in a server's life. Why? Because church people come. Some of you that are servers, you understand it. You've been there. That's why I tell you, when you go out to eat, you need to tip well. If you don't tip well, say you're from another church. Matter of fact, don't even say that you're a Christian. Say you just left the bar. I mean, something, I don't know. We go out and we do things. We don't live an excellent life. And we, we cause people to look badly at Jesus because of what we do. Now, I screw up, and it's all mine. Anything that good ha comes from me, Jesus is all in charge of that. He's done it all. All the bad stuff, the devil didn't do it, man. I did it all by myself. I ain't giving him any more credit than what he deserves, right? Live an excellent life. Make sure that as we, we live a life, that we live one worthy of Jesus Christ, he tells us to make sure that we're living properly amongst the Gentiles. Live properly amongst those people who don't know Jesus. Why? Because we want them to know him. So let me ask you a couple of questions real quick on this one. How do you handle problems at work? With a hammer. How do you handle problems at work? Wait. What do you do when someone tells a dirty joke around you? Do you laugh? You better not laugh. How do you dress? How do you dress? How do you spend your money? How do you raise your children? How do you respond when tragedy strikes? Here's one I think we all need to work on. How do you deal with difficult people with a hammer? Some of you guys will never come to me again. Uh, listen, so all of those things are good, and we have to rem remind ourselves about all those things because people are watching us. They want to see what we're going to do when you get put in a storm. I've said it a million times. I'll say it a million more. You, if you're saved, your life is no longer your own. You've been bought with a price. You're not going through life for yourself. You're going through life for somebody else. So how do you respond to things? doesn't matter for you. It matters to the people watching you. I don't ever want to get to heaven. I'm going to because there's people I know. I don't want to get, I don't want to, get to heaven and have to hear, hey, if you'd done better, that person over there would be saved. You say, well, when we get to heaven, we're not going to remember all of that. Read in the back of your Bible. Remember, I said get a Bible. Read in the back of it in the book of Revelation. Before Jesus wipes all the tears away, everybody will be brought up out of hell. Everybody will be brought up for the final judgment. And I believe at that point in history that you'll stand there and you'll look across and you'll see Bob, Jane, John, and Jack the people that you should have lived differently in front of, you should have said different things, and all four of them are going to hell, and you're going to sorrow so greatly because they're going. Because we did not live an excellent life. We did not live a life worthy of Christ. People are watching. If you don't think people are watching, do something stupid, my kids will do it, and then I'll come talk to you. I'm serious. My kids watch everything. Say something, and they come back to you and say, hey, did you da 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 Like, they don't forget anything. I don't remember doing that as a kid. Number three, don't be surprised when you're unfairly attacked. Right? Our verse says in, in verse 12, conduct yourselves honorably among the Gentiles so that when they slander you as evildoers. Slander's lying, right? So don't be surprised when you're unfairly attacked. But you know what? 
if you're living your life the way you, you're supposed to, when they attack you, it doesn't matter. Right? Because God will vindicate you. You don't need to stick up for yourself. I'm not saying you stand there and let someone come punch you in the face. Okay? I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is, Ben, if someone comes and starts slandering you and attacks you, you don't need to say anything. Right? God will take care of you. King David had that. People slandered him and unfairly attacked him, and he said, okay. Jesus, you know where my heart is. You know what's inside me. I'm going to leave it be. See, don't be surprised when it comes, though. What I find with Christians is people, oh, they're saying bad stuff about. They lied about Jesus. They killed him after they lied about him. They just telling stories on you. Why would it be any different for us? See, people in the 21st century, 22nd, I, first, second, I don't know, happens whenever, how many century, never mind. Uh, <laughs> when people lie, they do. You all lie. You're born liars. That's what we do, right? But we have the opportunity to not do that. But when other people lie about you, you know the truth and God knows the truth. Who else are you trying to please? Don't be surprised when they unfairly attack you. Number four, and we're done. <laughs> hey, hey. He's his mother's child. He looks like me, but he's his mother's. Number four, remember the day of visitation. What? We're doing visitation? The Bible says they will observe your good works and will glorify God on the day he visits. How many of you believe Jesus is coming back? Amen. Those of you who don't believe he's coming back, you're going to be in shock when he shows up. Okay? Remember the day of visitation. You don't know when he's coming, but he's coming. And you don't want your hand in the cookie jar when he shows up. Do you understand? See, people are going to watch. Some people will watch and remember the day he's coming, and some will get saved because of what you do. So when he returns, they'll go with you. Right? Because of how you live, and you know he's coming back. You don't know when he's coming back, but you know he's coming, so it's important for us to share the gospel. So some people will get saved. Praise God for that. Amen. Some people will never get saved. But that's not going to stop him from coming back. See, when he comes back, they're going to realize that everything was really real. But at that point in history, there'll be no more time. Yet it'll be over and done with. You need to remember every day that he's coming back. People need to see peace in us. They need to see joy in us. They need to see truth in us, forgiveness in us, strength in us, purity in us. We are the church. Not the building. We are the church. You've heard it said, you will be the only Bible some people will ever see. So how are they reading? How are they reading? Are they, when he visits again, will they be people who get saved? Will they be people who reject because it'll all be on you. See, when we remember, Paul worked and lived like Jesus was coming back that day. Peter worked and lived. When he wrote this, he fully expected Jesus to return again before he died. I know we say, hey, Jesus is coming again. We, we get an amen. We get, yes, he's coming. I just asked how many people believe he's coming. Hands went up everywhere. If you really believed it, then why aren't you working like it? See, there's people's houses on fire. Why aren't we kicking their doors in? 
We don't want to offend people. What are you going to do? Drive them to hell faster? Remember, he's coming. Like a thief in the night. Like a flash of lightning, he'll be here. So what are you doing about it? Let me give you these last things. You can scribble them down real quick if you want to. It's just a simple format for everything that we just went through. Maybe it'll be easier for you. Remember who you are. Just remember who you are. You're strangers and aliens in this, in this land. Remember who you are. Have you ever heard people say, well, I just forgot who I was for a moment. Remember who you are. You're a child of the king. You're an ambassador of this, to this country from heaven. Remember who you represent. B, live holy lives visible of moral excellence. You know, the worst thing I hate to see on the news, I don't watch the news much. I definitely don't watch CNN, the country's negative news. I don't need to see that. But you know the thing I hate the most, whether it's an email, Facebook, whatever it is, whenever I see such and such pastor of this church fell or this happened in this church because I'm thinking, man, way to, way to black his eye again. We need, to, we need to live holy lives visible of moral excellence. Don't be surprised by spiritual hostility. Don't be, we're, we're going through a great book on, on uh, Wednesday nights. If you're not here on Wednesday nights, you should be. Okay, let me just say it'd be great if we had to come in here on Wednesday nights because we had so many people. But we're going through a book on Wednesday nights. Bring Jesus without freaking out. Right? Last week we talked about spiders and snakes and public speaking. But guys, don't be surprised when spiritual hostility comes your way. Because the enemy wants to do everything he can. He can't get you anymore. Right? Once you saved, you saved. Jesus said, I've lost none that the Father has given me. I got them all. Okay? He's not up in heaven when you screw up using holy white out to blank you out. Waiting on you to do it again, he'll write you back in. You mess up, he wipes you out again. Come on. God's got more time or more things to do. He's not up there waiting on that. What the enemy wants to do is send some hostility your way for you to sit down and shut up. Because if you'll sit down, if you'll become like 95% of the church world today and just sit there and do nothing, come in, go out, check your little list off and do good, yeah, you may get to heaven, but the enemy's won. I look at it this way. As long as I've got spiritual hostility coming at me, I'm doing something right. I'm good with it. As long as I've got people that are ticked off at me, number one, I probably talk, but number two, the enemy, the enemy's doing something. So I must be going down the right path. Don't be surprised when it comes. D, do good anyway. And I know in a world today, sometimes it's easy not to want to, but just do good. Leave the results in God's hands. It's not yours to win. Jefferson, I can't save anybody. But you know what I can do? I can make an appointment for them to meet the Holy Spirit. I, I can't do it. God didn't tell me to save anyone. He told me to go out and tell them. Let him take care of it. After all, he's smarter than you are anyways. Just back up, shut up, and let him take care of it. I'm convinced most people don't get saved because we talk too much. We talk too much. The results are God's. They're not mine. Jesus didn't say, hey, if Tony preaches well, Tony can build that church. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell won't prevail against it. Amen. Makes it real easy for me. You don't like how it's going? Call Jesus. Makes it easy. And finally, be ready to meet Jesus when he returns. Be ready to meet him. Are you ready to meet Jesus today? Now listen, 
This is the most serious time of the whole morning. Are you ready to meet Jesus? If you take your final breath sitting in that chair and you open your eyes, are you going to be standing in front of Jesus or are you going to be in the flames of hell? Well, preacher, I've been to church. I even got baptized. That's not what I asked you. Are you ready to meet Jesus? See, if I asked you right now, why are you going to heaven? What would your answer be? Why are you going to heaven? What would your answer be? See, if you can't answer that because of Jesus, if anything comes in because of I did or I did, you're, you're not there. We want to take the Bible. We want to show you today. He said, well, preacher, my life is all kinds of jacked up right now. That's why you're here. But I want to introduce you to a guy that can fix it, that can help you get through it. Are you prepared to meet Jesus? James says, your life's a vapor here and then gone. Several weeks ago, many of you know, Kobe Bryant was a basketball player for the Lakers. Him and his 13-year-old daughter were on a helicopter headed to go to some ball game on a Saturday morning. The helicopter crashed that quick. See, it doesn't matter who you are. At some point, we're all going to die. Right? They used to tell me there were two things that you couldn't afford to afford, avoid doing, dying and paying taxes. Right? At some point, you're, we're all going to die, and the government's figured out at some point to make everybody pay taxes. Are you prepared to meet Jesus when you die? Because if you say, I'm not sure... Guys, I want to talk to you. I don't want you to leave here thinking, I'm not sure. Because Jesus says you can know for sure that heaven's your home. I know I'm going to heaven. I mean, I got no questions. I know that's where I'm going to be. I don't want to see you go with me. But I can't make the decision for you. So I want to pray for you. Brother Ron, if you can play a song. I want to pray for you, and we want to give you the time right now. If you don't know Jesus and you got questions, I'm going to say, hey, come, come talk to me. I'm going to be right here. It, maybe you, you say, I know Jesus, but I've not been living my life the way I'm supposed to. I'm not doing what God wants me to do. The altars are open. Come and pray. There's no reason to walk out of here the same that you walked into here. Okay? You should walk out of here different. Whether you come and pray or not, you should be different when you walk out of here. But if you don't know Jesus, I want to talk to you this morning. Father God, we thank you for this day. And God, we thank you, Father, for your word. We thank you that Peter, Father, had that same desire to make a difference in the world. And God, he's given us a formula that if we'll just follow it, God, we can make a difference too. So Father, I pray right now for all your children in this room, Father. God, I pray that we would be difference makers. God, I pray that we would do what you've called us to do, God, that we could abstain from sinful desires, Father, that you would be the one, Father, helping us get through that, Father, that we would meditate upon your word, that we would spend time with your people, Father, with you, so that we can abstain from that. God, I pray that we would live lives, Father, that would be worthy of you, Father, live in, in such a manner that people would see us and want to know what's different, why are we doing it this way, God, that most of all, Father, I pray that we wouldn't get tripped up by the enemy's plans, Father. As people slander us, God, that we would understand who we are in you. And, Father, that we'll just keep trucking on. God, we're going to leave all the results up to you. It's not for us to argue and fight and try to figure it out, God. But we know that you've got our backs. And, Father, most of all, God, we want to be prepared to meet you. Prepared to meet Jesus when, when you send him back. So, Father, for those right now who have no relationship with him, God, I pray your Holy Spirit would tug upon their hearts. Father, I pray that they wouldn't leave this room, this property, without first getting to know who you are. God, I'm not saying, Father, they make that decision this morning. God, what I'm saying is they make that step. They step one step closer to a relationship with Jesus. God, we all come from a jacked up, broken up life. So, Father, I pray that we would all want to meet the person who can help straighten it all out. Again, Father, as the altars are open, God, I pray that you'll move upon the hearts of your people. It's in Jesus' name we pray.